Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, BioLayer Interferometry, as a strategic platform to validate covalent proximity-inducing small molecules with synthetic tumor immunotherapeutic applications. I am Sabrina Lamus of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Sartorius. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their site at sartorius.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click the Send button. If you are having trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking the Ask a Question box located to the far left of your screen. I'd now like to introduce our presenters, Dr. Anthony Rulo, Assistant Professor, Chemical Immunology Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine, McMaster Immunology Research Center, Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, McMaster University, and Dr. Neil Schatz Selim, Marketing Applications Manager at Forte Bio. For a complete biography on our presenters, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Salim, you may now begin your presentation. Hello and welcome again to our webinar today. Uh, I will give you a short introduction to octet bilayer interferometry platforms before I hand over to Professor Rulo, who will talk about his research developing small molecule immunotherapeutics. Octet bilayer interferometry platforms are commonly used in three main types of applications, among others. Kinetic characterization involves the measurement of binding on rates, off rates, and affinities between a range of analytes from small molecule, peptides, antibodies, to larger nanoparticles, liposomes, or even cells. Octet platforms are used in quantitative applications as well, uh, performing immunoassays, for biologics quantitations, where users can adopt a direct one-step, sandwich, or a multi-step assay format to achieve sensitivities from milligrams per mil to picograms per mil. Octet ELISAs are um, rapid and efficient, where quantitation of a full 96 well plate of IgGs, for example, can be done in two minutes with the HDX. Octet platforms are also ideal as a screening tool where binding data can be used as part of a hit selection campaign, a test for functional activity of biomolecules, a screen of epitope binning, or even rank ordering for protein expression analysis or binding affinities. Core to a BLI technology is the biosensor, where binding interactions take place and are monitored. The biosensor consists of a fiber optic attached to a polypropylene hub with a specific chemistry available at the end of the biosensor tip. That will enable you uh, to capture a specific ligand, uh, immobilize the ligand. A typical octet experiment would involve immobilizing uh, one binding partner to the biosensor before the biosensor goes and reads for binding uh, of, from a sample plate with test analytes. L let's take a look at how uh, octet bilayer interferometry measures binding. So the technology is based on uh, uh, bilayer interferometry where white light travels through a fiber optic cable and goes through the highly reflective layer that is available at the end of the biosensor surface. Now, when there is a uh, binding interaction, what happens is uh, the bio layer at the end of the biosensor tip does increase in thickness because you are attaching small mo attaching molecules uh, as the binding complex forms. Now, what happens is the light is reflected back from this highly reflective layer to the detector. And as the thickness increases, uh, they will see light, the detector will see light wavelengths traveling off of slightly longer distances. That creates an interference pattern. Now, what happens is this uh, progressing biolayer uh, will enable calculation of the association rates as the uh, signals does increase when binding complex forms. And these measurements are done in real time. Uh, 
So next what happens is uh, the dissociation of the biomolecule from the biosensor. Now what happens uh, is the dissipation of the thickness of the bilayer, and that is also a kinetic measure where it'll give you the dissociation rate constant and the affinities. So uh, these are the off-the-shelf biosensor chemistries we have to offer um, to help immobilize one binding partner to the biosensor. Also note that we have biosensors recommended for kinetic and quantitation applications. So if you want to immobilize an antibody-based ligand, for example, you could use uh, FC capture chemistries or protein AGL L-based biosensors uh, based on the species of, and the isotype of the antibody. For immobilizing recombinant proteins, one could use our capture biosensors, his capture biosensors, anti-GST, or streptavidin-based chemistries. We also have offer biosensors that can immobilize ligands based on traditional amine reactive chemistries or hydrophobic-based adsorption using APS biosensors. We offer several kits as well uh, that can be used for quantitating contaminants such as residual protein A um, and Cho host cell proteins. And we have a kit for GLI-S um, sialic acid glycan screening. Lastly, I would like to introduce uh, our photobio range of BLI label-free instruments. As you can see, we have, a, we have to offer a range of platforms to choose from based on your throughput and sensitivity needs and also budget. In the top of the table, we have the benchtop single channel blitz system that is our lowest throughput system uh, that is intended for large molecule analysis. Next, we have our automated octal platforms in increasing throughput from top to bottom. The K2, the RED96E, the RED384, and the HTX are the most sensitive BLI platforms that can even characterize and detect small molecule interactions. Next, we have our automated octal platforms that can even characterize and detect small molecule interactions. The blue QKE octet system is ideal for large molecule kinetic characterization and quantitation. The throughput of each system is governed by the number of channels in each instrument. So we have system that has two channels, 8, 16, and the HTX has 96 channels. So with the HTX, one would be able to collect up to 96 simultaneous kinetic traces or data points. So on the right, we have some key benefits to using an octal platform in your research. That includes bringing you, providing you the ability to rapidly characterize and develop binding interactions or assets in real time. Octet does not use fluidics to route samples to biosensors. So in Octet workflows, the biosensor is the one that moves to a microwave plate and a dip and read measure collects binding responses. Since the liquid does not travel out of the plate at any point, there is no concerns of clogging and enables analysis of samples that are in complex matrices such as lysate, serum, and plasma that lets you cut down on your sample preparation or protein purification times. Also, the samples are non-destructive and can be, really, uh, can be reused of the plate if needed. So one other thing is Octet platforms are walk-in ready systems where no instrument cleanup before and after or a preparation step is needed. So you can run back-to-back -back experiments or get more experiments done in a day. With that, I would like to hand, off, hand over to Professor Anthony Rulo, our featured speaker today, to talk about his research. Dr. Anthony. Thank you very much, Nosha. That was a, a great introduction. So today I'll be speaking about uh, one of the major research platforms in our group um, where the where validation using the, the octet biosensors has proved critical in our ability to inform um, compound validation design decisions. And so what I'm showing here is the general concept of this research platform in our group. Um, where we develop these molecules that are that are designed to really modulate the proximity of endogenous proteins, immunological proteins in, that are already in our body with target cells. And in this particular application, those being cancer cells. And so what we're showing here in this little schematic is the, is the bifunctional tool uh, with a green sphere and a red square. You'll see this notation throughout the presentation. This denotes two different binding um, selectivities one for each protein you're trying to um, bring together. And this particular application, the bifunctional molecule 
brings antibodies that are already present in the bloodstream um, to target cancer receptors shown here by this brown receptor that you could imagine being on a cell surface, okay? And the molecule, the small molecule, increases the proximity between these two biological components. When your immune, when certain receptors on immune cells that are also circulating throughout your body see the antibody localized to the surface of a target cell, that causes receptor clustering and activation leading to immune function um, and cytotoxicity against the target cell, which in the case of cancer cells can eliminate the cancer cell, which, which represents um, a viable immunotherapeutic outcome. So just to provide a little bit of context here, this general idea of, of modulating proximity um, is, is not new in tumor immunotherapy. And so a lot of, a lot of very attractive immunotherapeutic um, hits and leads and, and that are currently in the clinic um, operate based on this principle. And so I'm just highlighting two really popular examples of immunotherapeutics that operate through this increase in proximity. Um, shown here in this box are therapeutic antibodies that are engineered to recognize tumor antigens that are highly expressed on the surface of a tumor, shown here by these red receptors. So the antibody binds both to these receptors that are highly expressed and also have binding sites for immune cell receptors like natural killer cells, for example. And so the engagement of both of these proteins increases the proximity of the immune effector cell with the cancer cell leading to targeted cytotoxicity, which this particular mechanism is known as ADCC or antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. Um, another popular type of immunotherapeutic, um, tumor immunotherapeutic engager, as they're known, is our bispecific T cell engagers, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Again, the same principle, where you have two different protein binding domains with specificity for a cancer cell surface antigen, as well as a immune cell, in this case, a T cell receptor. And so by binding both, you bring the T cell in close proximity to the cancer cell, and then through subsequent cell signaling and clustering events, you get T cell mediated killing of the cancer cell. These are really attractive cancer therapeutics due to the potential for very high targeted selectivity. Um, and we got interested in this field from the chemical biology perspective because we we, in, we interpreted and, and, and noticed, we're made aware of a, of a difficulty in being able to actually maximize the formation of the desired complex. So it's not trivial to develop a therapeutic that not, not only has to bind one target, but actually has to bind two. And only when both are bound do you get the, the therapeutic response. And so this becomes almost a bio, biophysical uh, physical problem um, and is in the realm of, of chemical biology. And it makes for a great biological question to probe with chemical tools. And so this is how we got inspired to develop technologies to really probe these interactions and try and modulate them using small molecules. So kind of, let me build off some of the more recent precedent in this work are a class of such engager molecules that go by um, different names. Um, one popular name is antibody engager molecules or antibody recruiting molecules known popularly as ARMS. And shown in this specific example is a small molecule that contains a, a serum antibody binding domain. So it binds antibodies already in your blood. Um, one particular class are known as anti-dinitrophenol antibodies, and so they recognize this dinitrophenol haptin that you can see here on the bottom left of the slide. And this arm or antibody engager is also equipped with a cancer antigen binding ligand, okay? Um, and in this particular case, it binds to a tumor protein antigen known as UPAR or urokinase plasminogen activator receptor, which is highly overexpressed on a number of metastatic cancer cells. And so the idea is that this small molecule engager binds both to the antibody and the cancer antigen. And in its simplest reductionist form, you can see forms this immunologically active ternary complex in the center, you, where you have the bifunctional molecule that, has, that is bound to both the naturally occurring antibody in your blood and the cancer cell. Okay, And so in this way, it engages both proteins. Um, in this way, it increases the proximity between antibodies and cancer cells. Uh, when you have a multivalent display of these ternary complexes on the target cancer cell, you then, if you remember our opening slide, 
activate immune cell receptors which carry out the actual cytotoxic killing okay and so we thought about this process from a from a more physical chemical biological biological perspective and so what we were considering were were questions such as you know how does the concentration and valency of these ternary complexes on the target cells impact the anti-tumor efficacy of these engager molecules okay and you can imagine that in studying this particular arm system, a lot of the findings could be generally translatable to all types of, of immunotherapeutic engager therapeutics, which currently are largely biologic, so bispecific proteins, like we saw in the case of the bite or bispecific T cell engagement. Um, another question we became interested in is how, how, would, how would tumor cell killing turnover by immune cells be, be affected by these ternary complexes, okay? As well as the therapeutics half-life itself, if it gets cleared from systemic circulation too quickly um, on the time scale of these immune activation cytotoxic killing processes, um, then that provides um, a real avenue for, for medicinal chemistry um, to try and improve the pharmacokinetics. So we were really interested in a lot of these kind of physical basic uh, science problems in tumor immunotherapy using small molecule engagers. And on the next slide, I'm just going to get a little bit more into antibody recruiting molecules and engagers and, and simplify the binding interaction so you can kind of um, understand what we're, what we're really thinking about, how we're thinking about these systems, and the kinds of biological questions we're after. So, you know, you can imagine typical to any, any bifunctional molecule, you have to consider the process of in vivo clearance of the bifunctional molecule. So in this simplified equilibrium scenario, we're just showing antibody engagers. So remember, this binds serum antibodies as well as proteins that are highly expressed on the cancer surface that are absent from normal tissue or are more likely present at lower densities on normal healthy tissue. So in any case, you would have the engager bind in any particular order to the antibody with a certain affinity as well as the protein shown here by this brown receptor on the target cancer cell surface. Um, it's difficult to control the order of binding in this particular scenario and um, in the absence of cooperativity. However, the fact that this would be administered in vivo into the serum would likely encounter serum antibody first before encountering the localizing to the site of a solid tumor or cancer cells. And so we're simplifying this, this scheme under a certain set of conditions where we administer excess antibody engager to make sure we saturate all available antibody and assume that the engager binds antibody before target protein. You can imagine how complex this equilibrium scenario really is in, in true biology, as well as considering the antibody engager clearance and how this clearance can potentially drive dissociation okay, of, the, of the much needed ternary complex for efficacy. When we form this ternary complex, we would have this somewhat reversible process that engages the immune cell receptor, like a natural killer cell, which then results in turnover and an irreversible process leading to cancer cell killing. Uh, one, of the, one of the key considerations in these types of engager um, modes of action is the dose. Um, and so depending on the binding affinity of the molecule for the target protein, in this particular case, let's say the antibody, you need to administer a large excess potentially to saturate all available antibody. The problem becomes this auto-inhibition phenomenon where if you have excess, you'll actually, your therapeutic engager will actually auto-inhibit its own function by forming these binary complexes shown on the bottom labeled um, with this term auto-inhibition. And so this, th these equilibrium constraints are, are actually pretty unique from a pharmacokinetic perspective with all bifunctional therapeutics. Um, and we wanted to think a lot more about about how these types of equilibrium processes impact therapeutic efficacy, okay? So I'm just kind of laying down the groundwork for, for why our platform explores these covalent immune recruiting molecules, okay? So the, the take home message on this slide is really, you know, it's very difficult to, to study and to maximize these multi-component complexes needed for immune function, um, particularly in vivo when you can't easily control binding affinities and endogenous concentrations of these target proteins, which very likely could be quite low in the sub-nanomolar range. And so really our kind of three major research questions um, at this point are really the, in, looking more specifically now in the case, in the specific context of antibody engager molecules, is 
this question of endogenous antibody concentration and binding affinity. We wanted to explore, are these sufficient for maximal ternary or quaternary complex formation and immune activation? Just for simplicity, we define ternary complex as one where the bifunctional molecule is engaged with the cancer cell and the antibody, and quaternary complex when you have the added binding to immune cell receptors that's leaded, that leads to function, anti-cancer function. We're also interested in, in exploring how maximizing these, these quaternary complexes um, in vivo um, basically leads to or modulates the anti-tumor response. As we know in tumor immunotherapy, um, achieving a prolonged anti-tumor response is critical um, to prevent relapse, okay, which is a common problem, especially with solid tumors. And we're also interested in looking at how these ternary, quaternary complex um, complexes from the perspective of their concentrations on the target cell surface, as well as their lifetime, their stabilities, um, how does this modulate um, therapeutic function? And so to, to really get at these questions and interrogate these processes, we came up with a, with a concept dra drawing on, on established chemical tools in the, in the, in the literature um, uh, to, to basically be able to make certain steps in this complex binding process irreversible, okay? And so what we do is we developed bifunctional molecules that had this additional ability upon binding the target protein to actually lock onto it and form a proximity-induced covalent linkage, which is, a, which is a popular chemical tool, especially in proteomic profiling. And so we thought this would be really interesting for a few reasons. Um, if you look at our, our what we're now calling a CAR, or covalent immune recruiter, in the, in the context of antibodies, this can bind the antibody and the target tumor protein on the, on the surface of the cells, but it does something else. In this particular example, this molecule, which if you can imagine in vivo, would also be rapidly cleared in vivo, um, usually around two-hour half-lives for small molecules in this molecular weight range around one kilodalton. Um, this molecule can bind an antibody. And in this particular reaction, I'll show you the particular chemistry used in this specific example, the, the domain that binds to the endogenous antibody is then ejected. Um, but effectively, you now have an antibody that's permanently covalently attached to a tumor binding ligand shown by this red square. And unlike small molecules, antibodies circulate for quite a long time in the body. So we thought this would be a really interesting way of exploring how the, the role of in vivo clearance on the tumor immunotherapeutic function, okay? Bispecific proteins, uh, like bites, also are rapidly cleared in vivo. Um, and so the idea is that you have this accumulation of, of antibodies now functionalized with tumor binding molecules. You could think of it as being covalently recruited now to a target tumor protein. So it's now no longer dependent on binding of a bifunctional molecule to the antibody because now the antibody is permanently programmed, if you will, with tumor binding capabilities. So this also probes the importance of binding affinity um, and endogenous concentration, because now in theory, we could functionalize all available target antibodies with tumor binding properties and study the resultant immune function. So now we get what we're calling covalently simplified ternary complexes and, and quaternary complexes to study how this modulates um, immune killing, okay? And I already mentioned we use proximity-induced chemistry to lock these reversible steps um, involved in forming complex proteins, uh, protein complexes that activate the immune response against the tumor. So we're going to dive in into a little bit more detail now and how we actually validate these molecules and how key BLI has been in, in executing this. Um, and we're going to focus on the specific system, which again looks at going after the specific subset of anti-dinitrophenol antibodies um, that are naturally present in the bloodstream at some relatively undefined concentration. And so take home message here is really our overarching goal with these covalent immune recruiter molecules is to increase the stability now of these immunologically active protein complexes on the, that, that we can now form on the surface of tumors and to probe the resultant effects. So just a little bit of detail into one example of the type of proximity chemistry and system that you can use. What we're showing in this example draws on this established acylmidazole chemistry. This is a finely tuned, kinetically stable um, ester where you can see again with our green and red ligands, one against the target antibody, one against the tumor. 
But now in this particular context, they're linked through this labile linkage. The idea was that this molecule would, would bind to a serum anti DNP antibody with a certain affinity a, akin to antibody engagers. But now you would have the reactive group in close proximity to nucleophilic residues um, proximal to the binding site for DNP on the antibody, forming this pseudo intramolecular complex, followed by um, an enhanced rate of reaction between this amine and this ester. Okay, and we're currently exploring several different chemistries and amino acid residues for these applications. But the basic idea is that you can selectively label an antibody that binds um, with enhanced rates over other abundant protein nucleophiles present in the body. So in this way, we thought we actually could use this tool for in vivo, potential in vivo applications because we could potentially, in theory, selectively label and functionalize um, one specific class of endogenous protein and swap out the immune binding ligands and tumor binding ligands to go after different systems. So what we're gonna talk about in terms of the validation of some of these molecules, I'm just showing here their chemical structures. Again, we have we have two basic domains, a domain that we're calling antibody binding domain. In this case is a DNP haptin that binds to anti-DNP antibodies, a target binding domain. So for this, we chose to go after an established tumor protein antigen that's highly expressed on prostate tumors, uh, PSMA, which is well known in the literature, and link these together through this acylimidazole. Okay? We could also swap out the target binding terminus with a fluorescent dye so that we could study fluorescent labeling of the target antibody in complex matrices. Um, we could swap it out with an affinity handle like, like desthiobiotin so that we could study um, binding and kinetics using the BLI platform and even potentially flow cytometry. Okay? and also analogous compounds that don't have this reactive acylimidazole. So it's a highly tunable system. We can tune the chemistry, the what we're calling antibody labeling domain, as well as the target binding domain and the antibody or immune binding domain. Okay, and so now to really get into the, the meat and potatoes of the talk, we really wanna feature how Octet is really, has been so useful in validating these complex molecules and tools. Um, so we wanted to probe the selectivity, of course, of these of these compounds for antibodies, and also also be able to discern covalent reaction from simply binding the antibody the way that an engager would. This is important if we want to accomplish selective covalent recruitment in vivo, for example. And so we thought of you know when we first first came about this, we thought about the conventional methods to prove covalent labeling. We thought about fluorescence polarization assays. Um, where we thought about having, you know, being able to measure three component binding in addition to the known artifacts and aggregation events that can accompany FP, as well as how the fluorophore that you put on can modulate the binding interaction. Flow cytometry, um, where we start to now wrestle with non equilibrium conditions because of all the wash depths and the shearing fluidics, for example, and the reagents are also quite costly. And then we thought about mass spectrometry, which is a gold standard for characterizing covalent labeling of biomolecules. But again, for this, you want to really employ a pure um, monodispersed mono protein species, whereas in the body, these natural antibodies will be polyclonal with polydispersed structures. And so what we thought in the simplest case was we could turn to octet and try a BLI assay. And the way we envisioned this was that we would immobilize on a streptavidin probe um, our covalent immune recruiter molecules. So we should look at step one. Where we, would, where we would work under conditions well under the KD of our molecule binding to the antibody. So the DNP haptin is, is represented by the green sphere on these covalent immune recruiters. And the red square in this particular example is a desthyl biotin that binds a streptavidin probes, but it could also be a bona fide ligand against a tumor protein antigen like PSMA. We envisioned we'd get this rapid, we assumed we'd get a rapid pre-equilibrium um, to a binding the non-covalent complex followed by a slower irreversible step uh, classic saturation kinetics, um, where again, the haptin is expelled and we get this covalent labeling of the antibody and subsequent binding to the probe. And so we envisioned we would see a fast increase in signal, which corresponds to the fast pre-equilibrium followed by a slower covalent reaction, um, uh, leading to a slower phase and an increased signal. Again, this is assuming a rapid equilibrium and that our concentration of antibody we're working with is well under the KD. If the concentration of antibody is well above the KD, then we wouldn't resolve these two phases, okay? However, we would expect to see a larger overall amplitude um, of binding of signal. So interestingly, 
And as is often the case, we didn't observe what we had anticipated. So shown here on the bottom is again, the same scheme to just remind you of the type of assay that we set up here with the BLI, okay? And the red and blue traces are us comparing a covalent immune recruiter that can label the antibody covalently with what we're calling for simplicity, a non-covalent immune recruiter. This is really just a non-reactive version. You could think of it um, functionally equivalent to an, uh, the antibody engagers I showed a few slides ago. Although we got, we got very selective um, recruitment of the antibody, you can see in the, the blue and red traces show quite substantial association signal when we add antibody to probes that are pre-incubated, pre-loaded with the covalent immune recruiter or the non-reactive equivalent. In the controls where we have non-anti-DNP antibody um, or when we incubate these mixtures with a high concentration of competitor antibody binding ligands, so just free DNP, we have close to baseline association. So we know that the recruitment we're seeing is selective antibody recruiting. However, the covalent um, does not show any advantage and in fact shows like there's somewhat less signal than the non-covalent version. Um, and so we were quite surprised by this observation, especially given we we're working at dilute antibody concentrations well below the KD for binding DMP, or what is known in solution. Also interestingly was that when we went to, to perform dissociation studies, so notice I was talking about how this system is really well suited for looking at K-offs, we saw a K-off that almost did not occur. It almost looked like irreversible binding in both cases. And so this is inconsistent with the binding affinity of anti-DNP for DMP, which is, a, which is reported anywhere in the 20 to 80 nanomolar range. Um, and so there's a, a few interesting inconsistencies here. The antibody appeared to, to bind much more tightly than, than was expected. And also the covalent reaction did not, we could not discern covalent reaction from non-covalent. At this point, we also didn't know if the CIRs were actually even able to label the antibodies. So this is one of the very first studies that we did using the BLI. I like this because this is a really nice example of basic fundamental science and, and validation in chemical biology. So I always like to include this. So, you know, we, we generated a few hypotheses. We knew that the non-covalent versions couldn't react. And so what we wanted, so we hypothesized that one reason for this really high apparent binding affinity may be a phenomenon known as binding avidity. Um, and so antibodies can bind to two haptins um, if, they're if they're close enough together, which you would expect on a multivalent surface, such as a probe on an octet, but also on a cancer cell that expresses high concentrations of your target protein. And so avidity, without getting into too much detail, really manifests as a very high apparent affinity that you would not calculate in solution in the absence of this multivalent binding. And so we turned to some of the great literature on this um, by Whitesides and others and came up with some strategies to probe if indeed we were seeing binding avidity here. And so if, if the antibody was binding to the NCIR or the covalent immune recruiter on the probe, we hypothesized that the addition of competitor molecule during the dissociation phase would lead to a rapid K-off, which would not be the case if avidity was not happening. You can feel free to look more into this literature if you find this interesting. Essentially, the K-off is expected to be independent of competitor if it's a monovalent binding interaction. If it's a multivalent binding interaction, the chaos is the apparent chaos is very perturbed by the presence of competitor, because that interrupts with rebinding, which is which is what drives binding avidity. And so I, I included a little scheme here for your for your understanding, where we incorporate this competition step during dissociation. This blue DNP glycine competitor molecule is added, preventing rebinding, which we anticipated would lead to a rapid chaos if these antibodies were binding the probes loaded in covalent immune recruiter or non-reactive analog um, and lead to this rapid dissociation. And sure enough, if you look here, when we perform the dissociation in the presence of competitor, we now see a rapid um, dissociation of antibody from the probe, which is highly consistent with binding avidity. Also, you'll notice the dissociation amplitude is not nearly as great for probes that were that were coated with covalent immune recruiter as they were with probes 
um, that were coated with, with non-reactive analogs. And so you would expect that when the compound, when the molecule can now covalently recruit the antibody, it will no longer dissociate from the probe in the presence of competitor. Now, some of you may be thinking about, but what about dissociation from the target binding terminus? This is why we chose desthyl biotin um, to load onto strep probes for these studies, because that affinity is so strong. We didn't have to worry about dissociation on that end um, in the context of these assays. And so now we, we were excited because we had what we thought was a way to actually monitor the ability of covalent immune recruiters to not just bind a target antigen on the surface, which in this case is simply streptavidin, but also measure covalent reaction with time. And so on the next slide, this is really just another scheme showing how we designed these assays. We would pre-incubate the probes with a covalent immune recruiting molecule or a non-reactive analog. We would then incubate them during the association phase for fixed amounts of time with anti-DNP antibody. Again, as we have, we expected that we would get a reaction, selective or not, um, which would correspond to haptin ejection, right? If you remember that acetylmidazole, the way it reacts. And then you would end up with antibody that was either non-covalently bound or some fraction that was covalently linked to the probe, okay? Now remember that the blue sphere is a very high affinity desthyl biotin and binding interaction. Then during dissociation, we flooded it with excess DMP glycine competitor, which should dissociate all of the non-covalently bound molecule, even if it's high avidity binding, okay? And all that remains um, would be covalently linked antibody. So by changing the incubation time, we could look at dissociation amplitude as a readout of covalent reaction. And this enabled us to make quite a bit of headway in this, in this validation. Okay, now what we're showing here is some raw octet BLI data. I'm showing the scheme on the top right, but just miniaturized, just to remind you of how the assay works. And what we can see now is through this dissociation strategy, we could discern covalent reaction from non-covalent binding, even though it was very high avidity, which was also a very interesting observation. By changing the incubation time, which, which you can see here on the probe is actually association time, we could measure fraction reaction versus time, shown on the bottom, which could also be done in the presence of control antibody that does not bind anti-DNP, because you'd expect if this, if this is working as we hypothesized, the covalent reaction, if it's selective, is dependent on binding to the antibody, okay? And so this allowed us to, to, to really to perform, you know, a number of critical controls um, and evaluate different covalent immune recruiters that differed in, in subtle structural properties to try and improve this proximity labeling kinetics. We could estimate this pseudo intramolecular rate constant for labeling um, of the antibody by the covalent immune recruiter, okay? Now, this being a, a complex distribution of antibodies being polyclonal, which is what you would see in the blood, um, we actually were not exactly sure what the um, amino acid residue was, although this chemistry is known to bias amine labeling. So we hypothesized it was most likely a stable amide or carbamate that was being formed to the covalent immune recruiter. So not only do these assays rapidly demonstrate kinetics, allow us to calculate the kinetics of these covalent immune recruiters, but also allow us to rapidly establish selectivity and validate that these molecules combined to two different proteins simultaneously, which is not trivial and not to be taken uh, lightly. And so if this actually could work in vivo, this would actually essentially be a way of, of programming all of your naturally abundant anti-DMP antibodies um, with the ability to localize to the tumor. And what's really interesting about this and potentially strategic is the fact that these antibodies would circulate for several weeks, giving you plenty of time to localize to the tumor and mark them for immune cell destruction. So after being able to validate the kinetics in this manner, where the streptavidin probes are preloaded with the covalent immune recruiter and then antibody is incubated, we wanted to go one step further and look at bimolecular kinetics. So um, some of you may be familiar with this term K inactive or KI, which is the hallmark um, measure of second order labeling kinetics in the proteomic world using covalent chemistry. And so one reason why this is really important to measure is because in an in vivo scenario, um, a, lot of, a lot of the kinetics, a lot of the, the majority of the time, you probably would be under this regime of second order kinetics because you're not under pseudo first order conditions. 
which you would only achieve if you either added a very, very large excess of the covalent immune recruiter to the bloodstream through administration, or the affinity of the antibody that's naturally abundant is incredibly high, okay? In which case you saturate that non-covalent complex, and then you have simply a first order labeling reaction. And so we wanted to actually look at, at the KNACT over KI kinetics. And so we developed another strategy, kinetic strategy, again, using the octet, but now instead of using these striptavidin probes, we use these pro-G probes, which capture IgG antibody, okay? And so this allowed us to monitor the, the covalent labeling reaction of antibody in solution. And then you use a bona fide tumor protein, PSMA, as a readout of the covalent reaction, okay? And in this way, we could change the concentration of the covalent immune recruiter during the reaction on the left, the loading phase, okay? Um, and we could actually monitor saturation kinetics to both prove mechanism and also to, to determine this KNX over KI calculation. Another thing that we really liked about this assay is it enabled us to, to probe binding and covalent reaction in the absence of avidity. So we could very clearly discern binding from covalent reaction using this type of assay format. So just to highlight this once again, the reaction that we're monitoring now is occurring in solution. The probes are now pro-G probes, so they actually bind to the antibody that is either non-covalently bound or covalently linked, okay, or not bound at all. And in that way, we can clearly measure monitor reaction progress with time, okay? So on the next slide, this is this is really this scheme on the top is really just a simplification of what I had already showed, where we monitor this covalent immune reaction, um, getting labeled antibodies that are actually bound to the probe, and then we can actually determine the proportion of labeled antibody bound to the probe by in adding recombinant tumor protein antigen, which in this case is PSMA, leading to an increase in signal. So this allowed us to to really make a breakthrough in the kinetic characterization of our compounds. You can see here that we can perform a variety of controls, the absence of antibody um, using non-DMP antibody um, and really monitor the increase in signal with time, which is proportional to covalent reaction. We can now clearly discern covalent reaction from non-covalent binding. And by performing this reaction at increasing concentrations of the covalent immune recruiter, we could actually demonstrate saturation kinetics and calculate the actual KNX over KI, which we can see here are the constants that uh, we were able to extract using the BLI. On the next slide, I just want to show a little bit of data that, that is consistent with the validation that was performed by the BLI itself. So shown here is an SDS, fluorescence SDS page gel, where we look at labeling this antibody directly in 100% human serum, which has an abundance of other proteins. On the left is a little cartoon of the covalent reaction. Um, now we're looking at fluorescence. And so what we did was we swapped out the PSMA binding molecule on our covalent immune recruiter with a simple fluorescein. So now we could see with nothing can hide, we can see every protein that this molecule will label. On the left is your standard Kamasi blue and on the right is fluorescence. In lanes one, two, and three, we dope in concentrations of antibody. We now understand the kinetics of labeling, so we know what concentration ranges to work in, okay? And we simply look to see where the fluorescence emerges. And consistent with the kinetics that we determined using the BLI and the selectivity that the BLI indicated, because in the BLI kinetics measurements, we saw very little to no reaction when we had competitor DMP or when we used antibodies that did not bind the covalent immune recruiter. We would expect the antibody that we doped in to appear on this upper band, okay, or hovering just above the 150 kilodalton ladder, and then we added 200 nanomolar or one micromolar anti-DMP to 100% human serum, okay. And you can see on the right, this really strong fluorescent band on lane two, okay, and even fainter on lane one. Um, and these really just differ by our addition of, of five times more anti-DMP antibody. Okay. In lanes four, five, and six, we add competitor DMP ligand to outcompete the labeling reaction to evaluate selectivity. You can see it all but disappears. Um, and so we were really encouraged that this molecule could selectively label this antibody directly in this complex matrix. 
you'll notice another band um, closer to the 50, which we attribute to the very high abundance of HSA albumin, great at, present here at greater than 500 micromolar concentrations, um, 500 to 1,000 times more than the antibody we're doping in. Um, and we envision that these the albumin could be um, labeled as an off-target reaction because albumin is actually known to bind to DMP with a reasonable affinity. And so we expect that these covalent immune recruiter tools would also label albumin, um, but with, with slower kinetics, which is exactly what we see here. So the tool is performing um, exactly as we had designed it to. And so we've, this was quite gratifying. Interestingly, um, if we look at lane three, where we did not dope in any anti-DMP antibody, we just wanted to probe the relative concentrations of the anti-DMP at least using our fluorescein system, um, it looks like the concentration of endogenous anti-DMP um, could be um, lower than what we anticipated and below our limit of detection. But this is still an area that we're actively pursuing um, to be able to quantify how much of these endogenous antibodies are actually present in our blood so that we can understand the ternary complex dependencies when we use these therapies. Um, and so further validation um, was to actually employ mass spectrometry using a model anti-DMP antibody that, again, is only one monodispersed uh, protein, um, one sequence. So we used this with a known crystal structure, um, a known anti-DMP binding site. Um, and this predicted that our molecules would label lysine, this particular specific lysine over here, 59. This is showing you a crystal structure doc of our compound in the DMP binding site. And upon performing mass spec proteomics, we were very gratified to observe that only one residue was covalently labeled by our molecule. It was the predicted lysine um, 59. Um, and this was actually impressive because the antibody, even on its own, not even thinking about all the other antibodies and proteins in our blood that have lysines, this alone has 44 unique lysines. And, the molecule only labeled at one spot. So this really highlights the potential power of this approach, um, which is well known in proteomics, but in terms of covalent immune recruiting, um, this is quite, quite a novel finding and something that we think will be very useful to probe these, these complex protein assembly processes in vivo and modulate function. And then I just want to finish off with a, with a little bit of, of um, immune killing, immune functional data using these molecules that were validated in the octet. Shown here is a classic uh, flow cytometry phagocytosis assay. These work by staining target cancer cells, shown here are hex cells that express PSMA. Remember, that's the tumor protein antigen that we were going after. Um, and uses, in this particular case, monocytes. So these are phagocytic immune cells that will engulf a target cell that is, that is decorated with antibodies, with IgG antibodies. And so you can see two colors coming together in flow cytometry scatter plots, and you can determine the proportion of, uh, of dual color events of, of double color overlap, okay? And quantify phagocytosis this way. And what we see here is that as we increase the concentration of our covalent immune recruiters, um, in the presence of anti-DMP antibody, we get this classical bell-shaped curve, which shows that we are inducing selective phagocytosis of, of cancer cells using these molecules that can bind to PSMA on the surface of the cell and also covalently recruit and link to anti-DMP antibody. And shown on the left are controls that typically include antibody that does not bind um, to the DMP antibody binding domain on the covalent immune recruiter, um, as well as PSMA competition um, molecule like PMPA, okay, which you'd expect to completely disrupt phagocytosis if the molecule is working through a ternary complex engager mode of action. And on the right, just showing a little bit of the kind of quantitations that we can perform. Um, to make a long story short, we basically could estimate the affinity of the ternary complex for the immune receptor on the monocyte responsible for phagocytosis by performing this titration and fitting this data to ternary complex models, okay? It's really also showing a schematic of how the, the CIR molecule, this is called three, um, that's the number that just donates the fact that this can, this can target PSMA on prostate cancer cells, and it binds to PSMA expressed on target hex cells, um, and the antibody then can engage in this, what's called the CD64 receptor on phagocytes, 
which then can lead to receptor clustering and phagocytosis of the targets, which is what you're seeing here in this histogram. The reason for the bell-shaped curve, if anyone's curious, is because as you increase the concentration of this covalently recruited antibody, you eventually reach an autoinhibition scenario where you have antibody that competes for binding to the immune receptor now. Um, earlier in the presentation, I had mentioned autoinhibition of the antibody. So you can see here, these are very relevant considerations when you're dealing with, with therapeutics that binds to two different proteins, okay? And then lastly, showing a different type of, of functional assay. This is actually used to validate tumor immunotherapeutic antibodies that direct natural killer cell cytotoxicity against cancer. Um, we want to see if these CIR molecules could induce CD16 receptor activation, which is the receptor on natural killer cells that re results in cytotoxic killing of the tumor. So this is in, in contrast to phagocytosis. This is a type of cancer cell killing that employs cytotoxicity. And as we increase the concentration of antibody, of anti-DMP antibodies, remember this has no ability to bind to the target tumor um, or activate the natural killer cell or the CD16 receptor in the absence of the covalent immune recruiter. And again, we get a very interesting dose-dependent increase in CD16 receptor activation, which leads to ADCC, um, when the molecule covalent immune recruiter covalently recruits the antibody. Interestingly, we don't see as much of an effect, if any, when the molecule cannot covalently recruit. And so this was something really interesting. We anticipated that the, that the real impact would be observed in vivo when the molecule could be cleared. Um, we did not envision in vitro to see such a difference between covalent recruitment and non-covalent recruitment, especially at high concentrations of antibody. Um, so this um, actually is something we're still investigating um, to look into the origins of, of, of how covalent immune recruiting is, is bestowing such an advantage in immune cell activation versus traditional non-covalent approaches. Um, just very briefly, if you look at the black line, that is our, our maximum condition where the molecule, the CIR, is incubated with antibody and then added to the target cells in the presence of these immune receptors. And then controls where the same process is repeated but with a non-reactive, um, or you could consider it an antibody recruiting molecule control, okay, which leads to much lower or baseline levels. Um, we look at the uh, we look at covalent immune recruitment at time zero, so before the reaction could occur, and see a substantial decrease in ADCC. Okay, so these controls together really confirm the selectivity of the covalent immune recruiter, as indicated by the BLA data, and also points an interesting advantage over non-covalent recruiting under certain uh, sets of physical constraints of concentrations and affinities. And so with that, I'd like to just conclude um, that the BLI, you know, for us uh, really could rapidly and efficiently validate these novel covalent immune recruiting molecules and chemical tools. Um, and we're able to discern covalent reaction from, from binding, which is no trivial task and really set the stage for in vivo validation of these, which is where we're engaged now. Um, currently, we're working on a variety of, of um, a variety of different related projects in this platform where we're developing these molecules to selectively covalently link to two different proteins as opposed to one, um, and, and covalently recruit the immune cell directly. We're also engaged in developing new proximity-induced bioconjugation reactions to incorporate into these CIR molecules and also look into more of the, the kind of physical biochemistry of these processes and look at how these protein complex concentrations and valencies and stabilities govern the immune activation. And we think that these findings will find a lot of utility in guiding the design of bona fide tumor immunotherapeutics. So I would just like to thank, you know, the students who are responsible for all of this, all of this, you know, fantastic pioneering work. Um, these students are all incredibly new. The lab is only three years old. This just kind of shows you with the right instrumentation and the right students, um, you can you can cover a lot of ground um, and generate some 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 robust quality data. Um, so Nick Cerniak, Ben Lake, Edin Kapkan, Rebecca Turner, and CC Yang, um, all from the chemical biology program at McMaster, and all have been with us for one to two years um, as undergrads and now are joining as graduate students in our third year. So I'd really like to thank McMaster. Um, our Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine and the McMaster Immunology Research Center, which
makes doing chemical biology research um, in an immunology immunotherapeutic setting possible. Um, it would not be without this type of infrastructure and immunology support, which is here. Thanks so much to our granting agencies that have taken a chance in supporting um, our early investigator work, um, Prostate Cancer Canada and CERC and the Cancer Research Society. And thank you so much to Forte Bio, or to, sorry, to Sartorius for this fantastic opportunity and for your support and all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rulo and Dr. Salim for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. I see a lot of questions coming in. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the ask a question box located to the far left of your screen and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for today. So I will turn it back over to Dr. Rulo and Dr. Salim to answer some of your questions. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank Dr. Rulo for a fantastic presentation. So let's get in a few questions. Um, in a hypothetical application in vivo, what happens to arms that performing its function? How are they cleared from the body? What could be the toxicity or side effects? Um, of a non-reactive, um, by, by antibody recruiting molecule, um, we're, we're defining those as, as bifunctional inducers of proximity that do not covalently link to their targets. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's what the, what, what the question is specifically pertaining to. Um, they're rapidly cleared most, um, most rapidly through the urine um, from what we've seen. These are still in their preclinical stage, um, but that tends to be the major clearance pathway um, and occurs within one to two hours. Um, what could be their toxicity side effects? Um, you know, in vivo with arms, we really have not seen a problem with toxicity, even with really high concentrations. Um, I think a, a big reason for this is is the cancer cells that you that you, that you go after um, typically have such a, a high concentration of the tumor protein on the surface relative to the healthy tissue that with the arms, you're able to get a multivalent display of antibody once it does its job, once it recruits the antibody. And the immune system sees this polyvalent display of antibodies and goes after it and kills it. Normal tissue, even if a few arms bind it, you don't get enough antibody recruited. So it's this threshold immunological response, which is how immunology carries out its specific tasks so well. Okay. Uh, we got another question. So this asks whether, is there a reason the antibody engages forms a covalent link uh, with the antibody before it binds to the target cell? Fantastic question. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, we're also exploring what happens when we form it to the target cell first. This, you know, there's a lot of really cool scientific questions to go after here. This is one of them. Um, this largely has to do with how fast the reaction with the antibody is designed to occur. Um, so when we design these, anti these, these compounds, we try to optimize the reaction kinetics for one protein over another. A lot of that's done by imposing geometric restraints um, and modulating linker properties and reactive chemistries and the distances between the reactive group and the, and the ligand binding group. And so you could um, devise these so that the reaction with the target cell protein happens faster as well. So the, the, to answer your question, it's because they've been designed so that the proximity-induced reaction occurs much faster with the antibody than with PSNA, for example and the fact that it would encounter antibody biologically in a biological system before it would encounter the target cell most likely, okay? Okay, um, so will these small molecules or, or can it also act as immune suppressors then? Um, could they, they absolutely could. They can definitely be used for, immuno, for immunosuppressive applications. This is something that we've thought about but just don't have the bandwidth to go after. Um, but absolutely, you could use these to sequester antibodies to knock them out um, and flip things on its head and use them for autoimmune applications. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, another question, uh, it, how do you decide 
on the link between the TBT and the ABT, its composition or length. How how do you decide on it and validate it? I mean, it's a great it's a great question. It's a critically important um, consideration. Um, you know, it, it this depends on a lot of logistical factors as well as you know what you as an investigator can actually pursue and in what time frame. So there's those considerations as well. In theory, you know, a great place to start is to look at what you know giants in the field have used and have worked well in similar applications, right? And so, you know, peg chains tend to work decently well. There's a good trade-off in terms of rigidity versus flexibility, as well as solubility, and as well as price and ease of of synthetic incorporation, right? Um, and then you would you know validate the reaction kinetics and selectivity. Um, but there's other potential linkers that 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 are worth exploring that have branched alkane chains where you can control conformation of the linker. Um, amino caproic acid has been very successful. Even hydrophobic chains may, may bestow um, an interesting property. Um, sometimes we're, we right now are introducing heterocycles um, into these linkers to explore rigidity, triazoles, um, where you can protonate them. So yeah, it's, it's a great question. And there's an infinite number of linkers to choose from. Um, I think to start for proof of concept, I think you want to make sure that it's soluble, um, that you that it's chemically stable, so that you can actually perform the covalent reaction, um, and that it can keep the two ligands, um, you know, at least roughly spaced apart with with some sort of defined distance. You don't want it to be too floppy or too rigid off the start while you're doing your validation. Because there's quite a trade-off with these types of labeling reactions, you can, you can, you know, you can gain and you can, you can experience an entropic gain um, by having it very pre-rigidified, which can really enhance your reaction rate with the target protein nucleophile. But if that target protein nucleophile is not geometrically positioned right, now you can't sample those other states, and so now you've kind of shot yourself in the foot. So there's definitely a a flexibility rigidity trade-off with these types of designs okay I want to remind that we are slightly over time but i would go to the last two questions so uh, the rest the remaining questions we've got a lot of questions to uh to, to professor rulo uh, we will try and we will follow up with the questions that were unanswered so with that uh, one question uh what would be the advantage disadvantage of creating the covalent complex with antibody ex vivo and then injecting it rather than do the covalent reaction in vivo? Yeah, no, I mean, it depends what your goal is. So that's a very good question. I mean, if you if you um, wanted to develop a, a therapeutic, there would be um, potential advantages to creating the covalent complex ex vivo. Um, protein engineering is, is a, you know, is very advanced. There's you wouldn't necessarily need affinity labeling chemistry to execute that. You could engineer a residue and get site-specific incorporation. The point of these compounds is to be able to, to kind of probe and modulate proteins that are fixed by biology, okay, in real time. That that's the reason for 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 wanting to gain control over the covalent complex in this manner, if, if that makes sense to you. Okay. Okay. In terms of, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it really comes down to what your application is. Um, you can make an antibody drug conjugate ex vivo. Um, in terms of therapeutics, there, uh, in terms of therapeutics, there are potential advantages to introducing a small molecule ex vivo as well, or in vivo, relative to larger biologics. There's a trade-off there as well. So that might be one reason why you, you wouldn't want to, to, to generate the covalent complex outside as well, from a therapeutic standpoint tumor penetration and et cetera. Final question. Um, do you think this kind of experiment can be done using a surface plasma and resonant type assay? I think that these types of experiments could be done with SPR. I think you'd have to be careful of clogging um, using complex matrices um, for sure. Um, the throughput of the BLI is very advantageous, being able to do a line of these control experiments while you're doing the actual assay conditions simultaneously has been a big advantage. 
Um, I think you could you could use SPR. I don't know if I don't, I'm not convinced that the throughput would be as as good. Um, and I think you would run into. I mean, we have like almost no logistical handling problems doing these assays. They're they're. I mean, we had the the, the students that I showed started doing this in their third year of undergrad. Um, rapidly, so this is something that you know, probably wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do very easily with SPR, um, and especially when you have complex matrices. I mean, these are are larger biologics. You're using antibodies, right? Potentially doing this with live cells, it's it, it would be tricky with, with SPR. Okay, so with that, um, and due to the time, we want to respect everybody's time as well. I would like to thank Professor Anthony Rulo for the fantastic okay. presentation. That was really, really informative and a, a cool way to uh, look at covalent uh, immune couplers using label-free uh, platforms. So, and also I would like to thank everyone um, who attended the webinar for your time. And, um, you know, it was good to discuss all these questions. Um, and we will follow up with whatever the questions that you know we could not um, answer today during this live session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Rulo and Dr. Salim. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Um, questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period, those will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Um, and we would like to once again thank Dr. Rulo and Dr. Salim for their time today and their important Hi. research. Um, we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor Sartorius for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That is all for now. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.